Good morning and welcome to this Sunday's Living Hope Worship Service. This is such a beautiful day, another gift of a day from God. I'm Peter Rupi. And I'm Lynn Rupi. We're so happy to worship with you today. We can quiet our hearts, put aside the other stresses and issues of our day, listen to the word and music offered by our two wonderful pastors. Come, let us worship God together. Thanks, Pete and Lynn. This week has been a reminder that the way that the world should be and the way that the world is are very far apart. That's part of the truth that we acknowledge as Christians, that we come uh, because we are broken. We come because we understand that all of creation fell with the dawning of sin. And yet the good news of the gospel is that, first, it's not uniquely ours to clean up, that God is active in the process of redeeming, of reconciling, of healing, of bringing justice. And so we don't lose hope, and we don't get uh, uh, so impatient that we try to force, but we do uh, prayerfully come and ask God to make things right. We think about that uh, glimpse that we get at the end of the book of Revelation in uh, Revelation chapter 21, uh, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and it just describes how all the brokenness has fallen away. But until that time, God's people are still called to walk forward in faith, to work for justice, love, and peace, to continue to model what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God right here and right now. So brothers and sisters, let us be called to worship. Let us give thanks to the God who calls us, who knows us, who continues his redeeming and reconciling work in our world. Come. Join me in our call to worship. Jesus Christ has come into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Since we have a great high priest who has gone into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we pr profess. Let us praise his holy name. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanks, honor, power, and strength be to our God forevermore. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia. Come, let us sing Christ's praises. Please join in the singing of all hail the power of Jesus' name.
Our call to confession is based on the book of John, chapter 3, 6 through 8, and chapter 16, verse 8. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Please join us in the prayer of confession. You asked for my hands that you may use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I didn't want to see. You asked for my life that you may work through me. I gave a small part that I may not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you, only when it's convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive me. Renew me. Send me out as a usable instrument that I might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. The Assurance of Forgiveness, based on Ephesians 2, 4-7. through Hear the good news of the gospel. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he has for us, even when we were dead through trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. In Christ, by God's grace, we are saved. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Although we live in a time of many words, we've been reminded in many powerful ways this week how we need God's word. We need words that offer forgiveness and hope. We need words that lead to reconciliation and renewal. We need words that heal and set free. We need words of eternal life. In John chapter 6, that's precisely what uh, Peter says to Jesus. Are you going to leave me also? And Peter says, no. Where else would we go? Because you uniquely have words of eternal life. Please join me as we pray for God's blessing um, and inspiration as uh, we read God's word and hear it proclaimed. Let us pray. Gracious God, there's uh, moments that we're at a loss for words. You ask us to be still and silent before you. You ask us to listen uh, twice before we speak. And yet we rejoice that you're never at a loss. You send the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to teach us and remind us of everything we need to know. Although the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of the Lord endures forever. So God, in this moment, we pray that you would bring your word to life, that you would speak the eternal words of life that only you can speak. You would quiet all the other things that clamor for our attention. We might hear your word and not only be informed, but transformed by it more into the people that you'd have us be. We pray this in all things in Jesus' name and the people of God said together, amen. This week, we begin a, a new walk through the book of Acts. Um, and one of the challenges for the book of Acts is sort of getting the style of literature that it is correct. You know, usually if we were to do a, an accounting of the New Testament, we'd say, well, there's the four Gospels, uh, and then there's this brief book of history called Acts, and then uh, there's these letters, and then finally there's this uh, apocalypse, Revelation. Well, if we really approach the book of Acts as a pure history um, and bring all of our modern historical expectations to the text, we're going to be disappointed. You know, in the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, um, Luke says that here's the first half of this account that I'm giving you in an orderly fashion for a specific purpose. And we hear that echoed at the beginning of uh, Acts chapter 1, um, that now this is the second part. This is what happens uh, from the ascension on, is the continuing unfolding of the story of Jesus Christ, his words and his deeds, in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, in and through the disciples. So we need to understand that 
uh, the book of Acts is a, a selective history trying to tell us something specific, and it's written to Theophilus, and it's implied in Luke chapter 1 that Theophilus is already a believer. He knows some of these things, but he needs to be taught a, a lot more about these things. So Acts is a purposed history, and really maybe the, the sort of two titles that would be best to describe Acts, um, the church has wrestled with different titles for what's now known as the Acts of the Apostles, is the one I just shared. It's really the continuing words and deeds of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit through the apostles, or maybe the un continuing unfolding of the kingdom of God. And so as we come to the text, that's really what we find happening at the very beginning. We're going to start at verse 3 uh, and walk through and just listen uh, for what's taking place. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while they were staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they're gathered in Jerusalem. They've uh, What Luke is basically saying is the resurrection's taken place. There's been 40 days of resurrection appearances, um, and now Jesus is preparing to depart to what we know, call the ascension, um, but he's been continually teaching them specifically about the kingdom of God and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And these two things sort of get woven together, and by the time that uh, the disciples are starting to gather together and right before Jesus leaves, they have questions about the kingdom. And much like our needing to get straight, the style of literature that the book of Acts is to understand it properly, the disciples then and the disciples now need to be clear on what kind of kingdom this is. So let us continue in the text as they ask their question in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, uh, and we'll read through verse 11. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in chapter 6, the apostles, having heard Jesus teach about the kingdom and this promise coming to the Holy Spirit, uh, have sort of this uh, a little bit of confusion and expectation about what this is specifically going to look like. And so let me just repeat the question that they ask in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? One simple question that really uh, highlights three different points of confusion. So the first one, um, is this going to be the time that you will restore the kingdom? That restoration of the kingdom means that uh, it was must be like a sort of a, a political or territorial kingdom that they were used to. You know, when the kingdom, when David was on the throne and the kingdom of Israel looked like this, are you going to put it back to that? Really, their assumption, and an incorrect one, is, is this going to be a political reality? Is this going to be a territorial reality? Or is it something else? Well, Jesus is unpacking for them that um, it's far bigger than that. It's far different than that. Um, this is a, a spiritual kingdom. Uh, God annexes territory one heart at a time rather than one piece of land at a time. This is a kingdom that knows no geographical bounds, this is not a kingdom that is uh, represented in any uh, specific political ideology, although following the kingdom has implications on how we engage society and uh, how we participate in the public square. And partly to get to that, we hear Jesus saying, you're going to 
do this. While you're waiting, the Holy Spirit's going to come in, and the Spirit's going to give you power to help make this kingdom happen. Not only do we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, will your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and your will be done, but God, empower us with your Holy Spirit, and God, that's what Jesus says, the Spirit's going to come and give you power to help bring this kingdom about. So one of the things that really reminds us is it's a very different kind of kingdom than anything that they've wrapped their head and their mind around before. Uh, John Stott, in his commentary on, uh, says this, it's a, a kingdom spread by witnesses and not by soldiers. It's spread through the gospel of peace and not a declaration of war. It's spread by the work of the spirits and not by force of arms, political intrigue, or revolutionary violence. This is a kingdom that is going to take place by the movement and power of the Spirit through God's people. Not the restoration of some kingdom of the past, but a brand new, a much fuller work than the people of God were expecting. And so for them to fully engage in this unfolding kingdom story that is going to be the book of Acts, they need to start to wrap their heart and mind around it. And we too, we need to repent from uh, getting this wrong and confess that we've done that. We've sometimes tried to make it a political reality, a territorial reality. Uh, we've tried to lop off lines and say, this is what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. And we've tried to make it far less than the unfolding work of God through his spirit and through his people. The second point of confusion that the apostles are wrestling with is uh, one of sort of a nationalistic kingdom. Not only do they say, will you restore it, what it was like, but notice the boundaries. Will you at this time, Lord, restore to us the kingdom of Israel? You know, those old confines of what Israel was supposed to look like. Will you do just that? Will it be this nation uh, that we've taken so much pride in? Will this be confined to 12 tribes in this location, this piece of land? Well, notice how Jesus uh, answers that in uh, the next verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, Jesus unpacks the breadth and the size of the nature of this kingdom by saying it's going to start from the very center that you expect it to. It's going to start from the holy city, Jerusalem. But it's quickly going to move from Jerusalem to Judea, then to Samaria. And that's a big step for the people back then. Judea is just the larger area that Jerusalem's in. But Samaria, is, that's those folks who sort of got part of the story wrong, right? That's what people criticized in the Gospels. Wait a second, you, you can't go to Samaria. Those people are unclean. But the mission of the gospel doesn't stop there. It's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so what's described is uh, not this kingdom bound by national boundaries, but this international community of people coming together in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you think about verse 8, verse 8 is really sort of a good table of contents, if you will, for the book of Acts. In chapters sort of 1 through 7, you're going to watch the Jerusalem and Judea part. Um, in chapter 8, you're going to see the Sumerian circle. Uh, and then the rest of the gospel, or the rest of the, the book of Acts, is really going to be an unpacking of how that gospel goes even further. How God's people serve as witnesses to Christ, even to the ends of the earth. Well, sometimes... Understanding something is helpful to remember what was it promised to look like? What was the intent when it began? And what's the design when it ends? And particularly in our world right now, this is a healthy thing for us to do. You know, as you flip the pages back, it's this, uh, what Jesus is unpacking starts long before Acts chapter 1. It really starts uh, all the way back in Isaiah. It doesn't start, but it's, it's enumerated again in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. From out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem. 
this is not some mid-course correction. This was by design that God was going to make a kingdom far bigger than the people of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, there's uh, these inclusions of other people. There's the blessing of the, of the nations. Uh, there is God trying to bring other people in. Throughout the book of Exodus, there's this recurring motif that God did these things so the Egyptians would know. And if we listen really closely to the story of the Exodus, some of the Egyptians actually come. You know, God's been building this uh, people that's far bigger than any one nation. And so in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, we get that uh, sort of a beginning look. What is it? The word's going to go out to them. And that's what's taking place as God is sending his disciples to be witnesses, even to the ends of the earth. But it's also helpful to look from the end. What does it look like at the very end? Well, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, we get a picture of what it looks like. Friends, listen to these words. And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne into the Lamb. What a wonderful picture of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Saints from every tribe and tongue, from every nation, not bound by some geographic border, but all these clothed in white, meaning that they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, are there in front of the throne, worshiping God and praising the Lamb. We look at the beginning and the word's going to go out and is intended to be a blessing to the nations. We look at the end and we see this uh, multi-ethnic, multi-geographic, multilingual, international community of the people of God. That's what's being described here. It's being described that God's family, God's people is far larger than one nation. The disciples, are, the apostles are thinking too small. Are you just going to do Israel? And Jesus expands that to say, no, no, it's going to be a kingdom so great that it knows no international boundaries. And it's not one that race or language or gender is going to be a barrier for. In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free, no male or female, in Christ, all become one. And so it's a wonderful picture of what the kingdom of God is truly to look like. But friends, when we look at that word intentionally going out and being sent as witnesses to do that, and when we look at the end of what it's supposed to look like, we, like the disciples, might need to confess the way that we've envisioned it much, much smaller the way that on occasion we've gerrymandered the kingdom of God into something that makes us more comfortable or is more like us. And yet God has been building his kingdom from the very beginning. And so we can't let race or geography get in the way. The kingdom of God is, uh, doesn't suffer from the lack of patriotism, but that patriotism should not be mistaken for nationality or race, or language. God is calling people from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue, every color of people on the earth to come and experience his grace and be made in one family. That's part of the blessing of being the church. We come with different stories, different backgrounds, different experiences. And God puts us back together into one people. You know, a good aspect of Ephesians chapter 2 is taking two people, two sets of people that seem very uh, disparate, very different, the Jews and the Gentiles, and yet fusing them together to be one people. That's the reconciling work that God is doing. That's the kind of kingdom that God is building. And so disciples then and disciples now need to make sure that we get that straight. Now the goal is this wonderful picture in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And then there's a third thing that the apostles need to be corrected on. Notice the urgency. It is uh, Many years as this was first spoken, think of how modern their question really sounds. 
Um, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to do this right now? Are you going to do this immediately? In some ways, it's that same expectant, uh, uh, instant gratification society that we live in. It's a microwave question. God, can we just hit the button and have this done? You're talking about the kingdom. You're going to send the spirit. So we can just sit back and, and, well, we can have microwave popcorn in under two minutes. Surely you can do something quick about the kingdom of God. That's the assumption that they bring. And notice what Jesus says to them. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. That's not for us to know. But he doesn't leave them at not knowing. He tells them, here's what's going to happen. But you, you have something to do, even though you can't know how long the season's going to be, and that it's not going to be instant and immediate. You've been given a task. You're going to go with the power of the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses. So first, it's a reminder that there is process to the kingdom of God. The word has to go out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. That God's people have been called to mission to go and be witnesses. In addition to being disciples who make disciples, the other primary call in our lives is to go tell people about who Jesus Christ is. That God would use that testimony and bring people to himself. That's what the church is called to do in between this uh, first departure of Jesus and the ascension, but then also the second coming. What do you do in the in between time? We are to go and be witnesses. Witnesses who speak about what we know, about what we've seen, about what we've heard, and about what we've experienced. That's all that it means to be a witness. So often we make it more difficult than that. So first we need to understand that it's a not an instantaneous process. It is a, a gradual unfolding. God is doing through the faithful work and witness of his people. But that's the second truth. We're not bystanders in this. God told the apostles then, yeah, I can't give you the time, but I can tell you what you're supposed to do while you're waiting. And that call to the church hasn't stopped. The great mission of the church is to go out to Jerusalem. to your neighborhood, to people who are like you and people who are not like you, and to display the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The call of the church is to go to Judea, go to the suburbs around where you live, to go to Samaria, to the little place a little far off where people are a little bit different than us, and even the ends of the earth where people might need to be trained in languages and culture, but how to effectively communicate God's love in a way that they can understand. Once again, we're reminded of the international, multi-ethnic, beautiful kingdom of God. And so we, like the apostles then, probably need to confess and repent. Confess that we grow impatient, that it hasn't happened yet, uh, that it's not instantaneous, but also that on occasion, we've not participated in the way that we're called to as the book of Acts begins. There's this crucial understanding about what's taking place. And as you even listen to the uh, final words of the ascension, as Jesus is taken up, that angels appear. And in Luke's collective writings, angels don't appear very frequently. They appear to announce the birth of the Savior. Uh, they appear at the empty tomb. And here they appear at the ascension as Jesus is taken up. And that means so much for us that the resurrection appearances have stopped, that uh, that great high priest is now in the heavens and is interceding for us, that we can approach the throne with grace. But the important thing that Luke wants us to see in the book of Acts is that the disciples are sort of accused of stargazing. Let me read it for us one more time. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? What he's really saying by implication is, you know, the kingdom's not going to build itself, and the kingdom's not going to be built by you just staring up into the sky. No, we need to uh, prayerfully be in contact with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but we need to go in his name. We need that balance of prayer and action. 
It's not one or the other, it's both. And so staring up in constant memorial that we can't wait till Jesus comes back and that he's going to do all the work, even the angels critique the initial disciples for that. So friends, as we begin our walk through the book of Acts, may we never lose sight to what the kingdom is really supposed to look like. God is sending his spirit to empower his people, disciples like you and I, to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That we would be active participants in building the international, multi-ethnic, beautiful people of God. Let us not shrink from the awesome calling that God has given us. Let us confess and repent for the ways that we've fallen short for our misunderstandings. But let us be empowered by the Spirit to go. To go next door, to go across the street, to go wherever God is calling. That we might continue to be witnesses and be used for his glory in building the kingdom of God. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. Christ is seated at the right hand of God to show that he is head of his church and that the Father rules all things through him. Through his Holy Spirit, he pours out his gifts from heaven upon us, his members, and by his power, he defends us and keeps us safe from all enemies. In all our distress and persecution, we turn our eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in our place before God and so has removed the whole curse from us. Please join with me in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you that uh, you reveal yourself. That you are a God who is holy, and righteous, God of justice and compassion. A God who is long-suffering and merciful. And God, this week, as we have been reminded once again of uh, how broken our world can be, how broken people can be, how broken that we can be, we rejoice that uh, you reveal yourself as a God who uh, is busy with reclamation projects. That even before the fall came, uh, you had a plan in place for Jesus to come 
to redeem us by his death on the cross and to reconcile us to you. That once reconciled to you, we could be reconciled to one another. God, we pray that you would continue to give us fresh understanding and right understanding. about how our world works, about how fallen it truly is, about the need for us to renew our hearts and our minds. And so, God, we thank you for your word as it continues to point out various areas that we fall short. We thank you for this uh, passage from the book of Acts that reminds us of how um, one little verse displays three significant points of confusion for disciples about the kingdom. We thank you for the opportunity to sit and to learn from them, but we also want to take this opportunity to confess the way that we have wanted to reduce your kingdom to a a political or a territorial region. How we too get bound up in a, a nationalistic approach to the kingdom. And how we expect it to be done instantly and without our participation. Oh God, remind us and renew us that uh, you are building a spiritual kingdom by the power of your spirit. Built through faithful witnesses that go. Not through the exercise of human power. But through proclamation of good news. You remind us that you're building an international kingdom. kingdom built with people of every skin tone, of every tribe, of every nation. And God, we confess that there's times that we get caught up in our differences and get upside down with the way that you're unifying us through the love and sacrifice of Christ. So God, you're building a, a spiritual kingdom. You're building a an international kingdom, and you invite us to catch stride with the Holy Spirit and go and be witnesses. Witnesses to places that we're comfortable, witnesses to places that we're uncomfortable. Witnesses to people who are like us and to people who are not like us. God, forgive us for the times that we've withheld the gospel, that we've gerrymandered the kingdom. We've been so caught up in uh, our blessings that we've produced uh, an inconsistent following. Sometimes we even refuse to go. God, forgive us for making the kingdom all about us and not about you and your will. And God, we pray that in the same way that this word has searched our hearts and that your spirit has highlighted some areas that we need to repent and confess, we pray that you would continue to do that. For the ways that we minimize others, the ways that we objectify others, the ways that we've limited. God, use this moment to be one that you not only continue to shape your people into who you would have us be, but that we might be sent forth to model to the world something radically different. And God, we ask for healing and peace to be with those who have been subjected to injustice, for those that have been made to feel that they're less than whole, to those who've been maligned and oppressed, those who bear deep loss and wounds, to those who continue to walk roads of grief. God, we ask for your healing hand to move among our nation. That this would not be a moment that uh, historians look back and say, remember uh, the last time is uh, these things happen again. But God, use this for your glory. 
Use this as a time of reconciliation, of healing. God, do the work that only you can and help us engage in it. God, let us not settle for anything less than the reconciling and the building of the kingdom of God that you have in mind. And God, we ask uh, your blessing on each one of us individually and collectively as we go forward. We ask your blessing on the church, not only Living Hope, but 5.7 and Crossway and all of your churches. That you would empower it with the, your Holy Spirit to go and make a difference in Jesus' name. And God, we give you thanks and praise uh, and ask for your continued blessing to be with uh, Kathy Diskin as she's had her surgery and continues to recover. Uh, we pray for Pam Ryan as she is uh, recovering and doing rehab at home following a couple small strokes. Continue to be with she and Pam, or she and uh, Tom as they continue to walk this road together. And God, we pray for um, Detroit. We pray for this metro area. We pray that you would continue to do the good work that you've begun. So Lord, we entrust ourselves to you. We entrust our world to you. Because you are our Lord and our God. So we pray this in all things, in the strong and saving name of our Savior, and pray together the prayer which he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For our sun moment today, Peter and I have been talking about the conditions of the world right now on top of the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial injustice, political and, and cultural divides. Uh, we're all overwhelmed, heartbroken, frustrated. Um, what can we do about it? There are three things that we um, would like to suggest today. The first one is to pause. Jesus didn't do anything quickly. He paused, he reflected, and he prayed on it. And through doing those steps, pause, reflect, pray, and then reach out, having those conversations to our own families at our own tables, and then to our community and beyond, across divides, and just truly listen more than talk, and seek to understand, and let's move the parameter just a little bit to more of a balance where we can truly see each other eye, eye for eye and as, an, as equals. And that way we can move together towards the greater good, towards God's true intention for all of us to live in harmony, to love one another. It would be great to see more tangible ways demonstrated in, in this throughout the week. So let's let's hear back from you. What worked, what didn't work? I called up a friend that um, has different perspectives and we had, she was just glad to hear that someone was willing to listen. And I think that's really a start. So start, go be the church. Have a blessed week.
as we prepare to go our separate ways, never forget that once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you know the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once you were mired in deep darkness, but God has called you out of darkness and brought you in his marvelous light. Now receive God's blessing uh, as it comes to us from the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more than all that we can ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. It has been a blessing to share this video worship experience with you. Um, just a brief announcement this morning, an important one, though. Uh, I want to remind you that the uh, Evangelical Presbyterian Church uh, has set tomorrow as a day of uh, fasting, of prayer, and lament. I want to read just a, a brief uh, excerpt from this call. As social unrest escalates, it is appropriate for the church to lament the crisis to the Lord, to fast and to pray about how we as believers in Jesus Christ can be a part of the solution to racism, inequality, and injustice that violate the ideals and just by our constitution and laws. So we are invited to humble ourselves and to pray to Almighty God for his grace, mercy, and love to heal the divisions in our country, especially for God's people to repent of the sin of racism. Attached to this uh, call to uh, worship this, uh, the worship link, you should have received uh, a link to some resources and some prayers for you to be able to participate in as we mark this day, as you are able. You know, the most important part is for us to continue to entrust ourselves to God, to seek his will and his favor. So thanks and God bless.